Holy Ghost for Christmas by John Hipsley. Let us imagine for a moment, and imagine what it must be like to be a ghost. We have missed the chance at life everlasting in heaven, whatever that may be. We remain in a transitory state of flux, unable to move on, and in most cases we are not aware that we have even died. People seem to really and readily ignore us, and on the other occasion that they do stop and look for as if our appearance frightens them as much as their appearance does to us. There is nothing to eat to temper the ravenous appetite that is the bane of our existence, nor is there anything to drink. It's always freezing cold, even if we died in a hot country. Quite frankly, I'm not surprised that ghosts aren't more forthcoming. It's very true that for most of us to decide to interact with the spirit world well, it makes us pretty nervous at the very thought of it, sometimes requiring a large amount of Dutch courage to even entertain the idea of using a planchette or a Ouija board. Ghosts deserve our respect, and there's no better way of showing one's respect than remaining fearful of their existence. In some ways, I feel that ghosts actually reinforce our understanding of the life everlasting. If we die, that's it. If we die, and that's it, and there's nothing but darkness, I don't really believe that any of us would really carry on the charade of life, if that was really true. Nothing to look forward to. The expression, you're a long time dead and life's too short, are really true. And feelings that we are just mere mortals. Maybe if we say that every building that's ever had anybody living in it has a ghost of some form or another, then can we fully understand just how it is that so many ghosts have been seen by so many people. Which brings me to another thought, that ghosts are not restricted to the Christian church. There are sightings in every country and every religion, even in countries where there are no religion. I will try to give you my side of a ghost story. Most ghost stories are just that, created to give the impression on real fear and loathing. Some people, however, who regularly experience the supernatural world behaviour, describe it in a very similar way. E.g., I woke up to find a spectre standing at the foot of my bed, his hand outstretched to greet me. And that's it. No background, no explanation, no reason for it to being there. I'm going to try to correct that in this introduction to Spirits of Christmas. The explanations are based on my own research carried out over the last 16 years into the disturbances in the city of Canterbury. Ghosts are around us all the time. Even now there's one standing just behind you. Yeah, just there. Can you feel the cold hand of his long dead body on your shoulder? No? Oh well, best get a move on much to see and not much time. The first place we look at is just behind me, where we now stand. It's attractively named off-license, now called Discount Booze. <laughs> it may have taken many hours of marketing expertise to come up with such a catchy name as that. It was here some eight months ago that some medical students lived and studied. It's a perfect location, really, when you think about it. An off-license underneath, a pub within staggering distance, close to the hospital, lots of retail therapy within easy reach. It may have been due to that feeling that everyone was just so that they came up with the novel idea following a session down the local pub to come back here in the early hours and to make a Ouija board to contact the dead in their semi-drunken stupor. It all made perfect sense. They did not have a board to hand, so in haste they decided to make one. Not hard to do, really. They took some old cardboard and drew a circle, then wrote the letters of the alphabet, then north, east, south and west, followed by the numbers one to ten around the outside. And then, finished off with a nice touch, they counted the signs of the zodiac from the Daily Mail. They took their board to the kitchen on the top floor at the back and used a kitchen tumbler as a makeshift communicator. Within seconds of lighting a tea light candle and touching the tumbler with their little finger, they'd make some sort of contact. It's fair to say that using Ouija board at any time could be very dangerous. With all that had happened here, it was not such a good idea by any stretch of the imagination. They asked in a bold voice, Is there anybody there? Well, in my experience, if they return the answer no, you're going to have problems. The grass was jerked towards yes. And then, according to one of the students, whom I interviewed at length, they got a strange feeling of unhappiness and misfortune. The lights on the landing flickered, and then they went out, and the candle flame flickered before flaring up. They felt sure this was a good sign, and proceeded to ask for a name. The reply was Abigail. No one in the room was called Abigail, and none of the students knew anyone of that name. 
so they pressed on. When were you born? The reply, 1846. Uh, when did you die? 1873. So she or it was 27. Well, how did you die? The answer here came as a shock to the students. Joshua knows how. Joshua, who lived with them in the house, was away in London that night and was studying oncology at the local hospital, but was not present at the time of the sales. Didn't make any sense. Did she die of cancer? They asked again. And the reply was just as strange. David knows the place. David knows the place. David was getting nervous, for he had, during the first weeks in the house, felt the presence of something on the stairs. But he had never told anyone else about the feeling that he had of fear and being accused of being weird if he had said something. His colleagues looked towards him for an exclamation, but he couldn't really give one. Then the glass leapt towards forwards again and spelled out the name of the person who had visited them that morning. Peter Wilkes was here this morning and last Monday, it read. This meant that whatever this thing was, it had been watching them for some time. The candle flared up again and then expired, plunging the four of them into panic and darkness. David picked up the board and threw it out the window on the flat roof just below but it still lies untouched. But still, a portal to the other side has been opened. The others, feeling that they had already experienced enough, it was reason enough to feel unhappy. They left the room and headed for their own bedrooms. Each locked their door to rent entry from unseen forces. David claimed that he stepped relatively soundly for an hour or two, was awoken by the feeling of something sitting on his bed, a heavy man of some kind. In the darkness, he wriggled out of the covers and then felt his way round the bed, but couldn't find anybody else in the room. Getting back into bed, he pinched himself to confirm that he was awake and again felt something pressing hard down on the bed. Thinking that this was his imagination, he opened his eyes to find that the kitchen mirror, usually located at the top of the stairs, was now floating somehow above his head, and the reflection seemed clouded. He reached up around the mirror to see how it was being held up, maybe by a wire, but as he looked, he saw the face of an old, gnarled woman staring blindly back at him. The face made him scream in terror. The noise was enough to wake his colleagues. But because the mirror had shattered, covering with shards of broken glass, his fellow students tried in vain to open the locked door for over a minute before using a fire extinguisher to break the door down. By this time, poor David had lost over a pint of blood, feeling military trained. They knew exactly what to do. They called an ambulance and tried to stem the bleeding. David survived and was taken to Kenton Canterbury Hospital, then transferred to East Grinstead Hospital for skin grafts to his face and chest. It was only a week after the incident that I was called to investigate the alleged paranormal attack. Prior to going to the property, I did my own research and discovered that during the summer of 1873, a young woman committed suicide on these premises. According to the local paper archives, there was some suggestion that the husband, who at the time was the landlord of what was then the Crown Inn, had been taking a beating to his wife most nights under the statute known as the Rule of Thumb, which states that once you marry a girl, you can beat your wife with a stick. There's no wider or broadening your thumb. She may well have been unhappy about this treatment, but at the time there was no chance of divorce simply because your spouse beat you up. You need a reason. The reason was that she, Abigail Peterson, took her own life following the attempted suicide the previous year when she had stood on the top step near the top room there. See, when I shine my torch and attempt to hang herself, on this occasion was unsuccessful and she managed to pull the ceiling down with her. Her husband came up and beat her up with an inch of her life. The following year she was more successful. This time she tied a rope off the top of the stairwell. Let's take a closer look. At the other end, she had pre-tied a noose and placed it over her head. Then she perched herself on the banister and jumped down the stairwell, pulling her husband's straight razor across her throat. As she jumped, the downward force was enough to rip the head from the shoulders, and the headless corpse landed on the bend of the stairs. Her husband, returning from his duty in the pub downstairs at 11pm, tripped over the body of this headless wife on the stairs and beat her in anger, assuming she to be drunk or asleep. But feeling remorse, he bent down to give her a kiss. Not a good move if she hasn't got a head. Repulsed by the taste of her blood on his lips, he fled the scene and was soon arrested for the murder of his long-suffering wife. 
He was taken to Pound Lane Police Station during the night. The frightened man took his own life. Ironically, he would have been hung anyway, had he been guilty of her murder. I brought with me a psychic friend here, a former blessing prayer here, and during the short service, one of the students from Christchurch University who had accompanied the party on that very night found that as we neared the top of the stairs, he felt something stroke the side of his cheek and brush his hair. It's all quiet in there at the moment. If you're looking for somewhere to stay in the city, it's nice and cool.